Can I introduce now uh, Rachel Cutting? Um, I've known Rachel for quite a while. We worked together in Sheffield, although we would often see each other outside of Sheffield more often than we saw each other in Sheffield, which was rather odd. Um, but uh, Rachel has recently taken up an exciting new appointment, and she is now um, the Director of Compliance and Information at the HFEA. And she's a former chair of the Association of Clinical Embryologists, and she's been awarded an MBE. Rachel. So this is my first uh, speech in my new role as working with the HFA, but as a background, I have been an embryologist working for 24 years. So I'm in a very privileged position that I can see things from both perspectives. But this evening, what I'm going to talk about is from the HFA point of view and from a legal point of view, and the challenges probably that the HFA have to face in ensuring that the Act is complied with by clinics. Now, this may seem obvious to many of us sat in this room because we're embryologists, we're clinicians that take patient consent. But sometimes it's good just to be reminded of those basics. And we have to make sure that anybody storing their gametes or embryos is given informed consent. And that was a really good point that you made earlier on. Informed consent is important. It's spending time and making sure that it's not just a tick box exercise. And of course they have to be stored with the, what the gamete or embryo provider actually wants them to be stored for. And there mustn't be any gaps in consent. So if a patient has consented for three years and you remember four years later, that's a gap in consent. The law says that there must not be a gap in consent. And of course that we know that the statutory st storage period is 10 years and that can be extended for medical reasons and as we said it will be addressed hopefully for um, the uh, and debated about social circumstances but the 2009 regulations are the one that we look at at the moment to say whether storage can be extended and this is all around the medical practitioner statement and the 2009 regulations are very clear. This is a written medical opinion which must be provided within the relevant period. And that is a really key saying and period that you must take account of. The relevant period has to be within 10 years of the date that the gametes and embryos first went in storage. So if they were frozen on the 1st of January 2010, that medical practitioner statement must be done before the 30th of December 2019. It can't be done a few days after when storage is, is done. It's, it's more emphasis on that in the law, and James will probably clarify that, than actually the actual storage consent. There isn't much room for interpretation there. However, although we really encourage Although we encourage the MPS to be used, and that's what should be used, if there is evidence in the notes that this has been discussed and it is documented that there is a risk of premature infertility or the patient has become premature inf infertile, then that may be enough if an MPS isn't there. The 1991 regulations don't actually state when that MPS form should be done. But what we've got to remember that is the 2009 regulations now that we are looking for. So what's the HFEA position in this? Remember, we're the regulatory body which has to make sure that the Act is complied with. And we should expect compliance from the sector. We should make sure that the requirements for storage are adhered to. But we know that mistakes can be made and errors can be made. And especially in consents, we've known this from the cases in the legal parenthood. But what we've learned from that is also about how the courts have interpreted this and helped patients so that they're not adversely affected. And the HFEA takes the view that it's likely to take a similar stance in cases where storage consent is there. This hasn't been tested yet but we are assuming that a court would t adopt a similar approach in the patient's best interest. 
And also, if there has been a gap of consent, assuming there is no other issues with compliance or requirements for extended storage, so if it's over 10 years and there is a risk of premature prematurity or the premature infertility, and there is effective consent in, pro in place now, so the patient's been contacted and there's storage consent in place, we're not going to come down hard on the patient and demand that those samples are removed from storage because there's been an unlawful period of consent as long as everything has been put in place. But there does have to be some regulatory consequences for clinics who have failed to ensure that effective consent is in place at all times. Because what we have to remember that actually storage of gametes or embryos without consent is a criminal offence for PRs. So we do have to take this seriously. Regulatory, consent, uh, regulatory consequences may be that the clinic has a shorter license, that they are more monitored closely, or they have meetings regularly with PRs. So if an, what the HFEA expects of clinics is that if you do know that there are gametes or embryos in storage without consent, that you report them to your inspector or consider reporting it as an incident explain what your actions are, how you're going to attempt to contact the patients, whether anything's been put in place to try and make amends, and take a lead in making a really detailed plan about how this is going to be um, resolved. Demonstrate an understanding of the law and make sure that's translated through the clinic so that everybody taking consent or involved in the process is competent at it. And put in measures to prevent reoccurrence. And the HFEA thinks this strikes a fair balance because we don't want to come down hard on patients where they're often in this position through no fault of their own. But what we have to remember is that we have to uphold our responsibilities as a regulator. The common errors that we've seen that have been reported over the last few years are simple errors in, report, in completing the consent forms. A missing medical <coughs> practitioner statement or a medical practitioner statement which is signed a year after the storage expiry date. There's a lack of understanding of the 2009 ex criteria for when sample storage can be extended. When centres don't have an effective bring forward system, so they're not recognising and noticing when samples are coming up to 10 year expiry. And there's no system in place to find out when patients have passed away and not using the correct regulations. The 2009 do state when we're allowed to extend storage, but there may be different circumstances, and I think James will notice, uh, will talk about this, if samples have been stored before 2009. Sometimes patients consent to defined storage periods, e.g. three or five years, and centres sometimes don't have the ability to pick those up. And of course, I've been there in my previous role. It is hard to sometimes contact patients. And this is why it's so important to either think about now consenting for 55 years or making sure that the patient has a contract so they know that they're responsible for contacting the clinics as well. And actually understand when consent expires. If we're importing donor sperm, for example, into this country, the storage starts when it lands in this country. You need to make sure that you talk to overseas clinics to look at consent, but the HFEA consent doesn't apply to overseas clinics. And the actual date that it's expired. So if it's stored on the 1st of January 2010, it expires on the 31st of December the following year. So understand the laws around that. There is a problem, we know that. Our head of legal have dealt with numerous inquiries over the last year. Some of those are just isolated, one-off incidents in clinics, but sometimes a clinic has multiple problems with the same issue. And what we want to do is to make sure that clinics do comprehensive audits to realize the extent that they've got in their own clinics, and if there is a problem. So what the HFEA plan to do is we want to raise awareness. We're talking about it this evening. We're in the process of doing some very clear guidance that we're going to issue in Clinic Focus that explains the regulations around this. We've done some inspector training, 
so that the inspectors can give better support to centres. We're going to plan a workshop later in the, the year that talks about how consent can be done, sharing best practice, and again, to understand the regulations. The PrEP tool has been launched, which is a brilliant tool for PRs coming into the sector, but it can also be used with your clinic staff so that they can understand the consent process in more detail. There's videos, there's trial questions. It's a really good tool to use. There is going to be updated code of practice guidance later this year. And of course, we always want to see improvements in consent forms, and hopefully that will come as well. And that's, thank you.